Okay, thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you for having me for the third time. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, as Johan mentioned, it's going to be um, a bit of a, a weird program today, um, but um, I think I managed to combine the, the two parts, the, the one part about my career in, in data visualization and um, the uh, technical part about a tool called Svelte. Um, and I think I managed to do that by focusing on some of the technologies that I have been using throughout the years. And also how I was able to um, gain new skills in, in basically in web development um, for data visualization. So I'm going to take you on a 15 year journey through um, data visualization on the web. And so let's start by going back 15 years to the year 2006. Um, 2006 was the year that I moved to Bolivia um, with my uh, then girlfriend, now wife. So this is me at the border at, uh, of Lago Titicaca at uh, Copacabana in, in, in the highlands of Bolivia. Um, and I was working there, actually working in the lowlands. Um, I was working in a rather big uh, Bolivian NGO who was doing projects with small scale farmers and indigenous people. So I was helping them analyzing the projects they had with, um, with cows, with bees, with um, plants. I was evaluating those projects economically. And I was also helping um, doing a research around how all these people that the NGO was working with were um, gathering their income. Um, and as such, I was, making maps back then already. Um, and I was also making charts uh, for the reporting. Um, but in my spare time, I was also experimenting a little bit with um, a cool new technology at the time, which was Google Earth. Um, and in Google Earth, you can make overlays. And that's actually my first real experiment with um, interactive and, and um, online data visualization. So you can see here the population of Belgian municipalities that I overlaid on top of the satellite imagery within Google Earth. Um, you could click around and you can you could get these pop-ups that showed you more detail so you, here you have um, a 3d pie chart something that i wouldn't make today anymore um, but um, yeah i was using technologies that mostly don't exist anymore today and this is something that um, is unfortunately a bit of a constant throughout my career. Um, tools, they come and go. And this means that a lot of my work that I did in the early days now isn't online anymore because technology evolved and, and things um, you know, will be left um, as they are. And at some day they, they simply stop working. So um, in, in preparing this talk, I noticed that a lot of things that I made in the past are not online anymore. So it's good to have some screenshots if you want to um, keep track of what you have done in the past when it comes to online data visualization. Here I was looking at where players at the World Cup football, um, at what clubs they were playing. So you can see here um, that Liverpool in England um, had a lot of players from a lot of different countries who were participating in the World Cup. Um, so you could make really nice things with, uh, with Google Earth back then, and uh, you still can. Another thing that I discovered in, while I was living in Bolivia were the books by Edward Tufte. Um, some of you might be familiar with his books. Um, they're actually one of the yeah, one of the best books about data visualization you can find. And they are, might be a little bit dated now because the inside stuff they had, well, they were not really always based on um, experiments and research. Um, so some of his claims and the rules that he came up with for making good data visualization, they don't apply 100% uh, anymore today, but still um, I can highly recommend those four books, especially the, the earlier ones. Um, like many in the field of data visualization, I uh, only realized that data visualization is a field by reading those books, so I, I can highly recommend them. 
Um, so yeah, I discovered them while I was living in Bolivia and uh, the same applies to um, this YouTube video. It's a TED uh, video by a Swedish professor named Hans Rosling. Um, he passed away a couple of years ago, but in his talks, um, he managed to communicate statistics in an incredible, um, incredibly engaging way. So he has this animated big chart in the background and he's really telling a story about um, what you can see moving on the visualization. And in that way, he is able to explain um, stories that are hidden in these numbers. Um, and I was definitely also influenced by Hans Rosling and all the work he did. Um, and if you haven't seen his presentations, I can also highly recommend them. So this is a bit of a background of how I ended up um, doing data visualization. Then uh, skip a few years to 2011. Um, I was, uh, I had returned uh, from Bolivia back to Belgium. And uh, at that time I was working at a small magazine called uh, Mo, a magazine specializing in international news and international development. And um, I was responsible for the website, but uh, on the side, I, I was allowed to play around a little bit with data and data visualization. Um, and this is one of the visualizations that I made um, during my time at the magazine. It's a visualization showing the number of medals awarded in Olympic games through uh, our time um, and to uh, different countries and continents. So each uh, color is a continent. You can see the legend at the bottom and the width of the, uh, of the chart and the width of the, um, of the polygons represents the number of medals won by each um, by each country. So you can see that the, the stream is getting bigger, so more um, medals are awarded. Um, and you can see also that the number of medals won by uh, African athletes is still quite small here, the, the black um, band here. And there's some other interesting stuff going on here as well. Another thing that I made back then was this interactive visualization of the 200 biggest companies in the world organized by country and continent um, and also organized by sector. So you could click any of the buttons on top and the, the graphic which highlight the companies belonging to each of these sectors. Uh, so right now we are looking at energy companies, um, and you can see that the biggest three from Russia, for example, they are all energy companies, um, gas and oil companies. So these visualizations were the first one that I made with D3. Uh, back then, uh, D3 uh, was just born. Uh, actually, D3 um, celebrated its 10th birthday a couple of months ago. Um, this was something new and for the first time you could use JavaScript to make online uh, visualizations and uh, it was quite easy to make them interactive as well. And the way me and basically everyone who was using D3 was using D3 is to use D3 for everything. So this is a, a basic structure of what a page using D3 would look like. You would load the D3 library which was um, quite big, it's a big library. Um, you would have an um, SVG there and then you would use DC first to load the data, then to do calculations on the data and um, use the, the scale functions of D3 to position things on the page. And then you would also interact with the HTML page by adding those um, SVG elements, in this case, the circles to the visualization. Um, so D3 was in full control and we used D3 um, for everything uh, from loading the data to um, rendering the visualizations. I made a little scheme to explain how it works. And this is a bit of a repetition of what I just said, but um, this um, diagram will, um, will be repeated further in the slideshow, uh, in the slides as well. So what we were doing we, is we were importing the D3 library and um, 
I, I made it quite big here because it's a, a big uh, library. And uh, when you loaded the D3 library, you would, ex you would have access to all the functions it contains. So you had, uh, in this case, a linear scale and a logarithmic scale. Um, you could couple them to the columns in your data. And then for each row in the data, you would have D3 add elements to the page. In this case, uh, three circles representing um, three rows of data um, in, in, in the data. So this is the way we used to make um, visualizations with D3. And it's actually also a bit similar to what we did in the previous two um, sessions that we had. There, we also loaded the full D3 library and um, and we also let D3 interact with the, the HTML with the, with the HTML document. Um, so this is actually the, the old way of doing things. Um, and let's see how further in uh, the future things are going. Um, let's move on to the summer of 2014. Um, I was then hired by a uh, newspaper, The Dead, which is a, a Flemish uh, financial newspaper. Um, they had seen my work uh, with data and data visualization, and they were interested in having someone on board who could um, tell stories to the reader based on data. So um, they, uh, they hired me. But just before summer, I had an accident. I was playing football, and I had um, um, a, a nasty, um, how do you say it? Um, I, I broke something in, in my knee, um, which required me to have an operation and which also immobilized me for a couple of weeks. So I couldn't join the newspaper immediately. I had to recover from my operation. And I was basically in my sofa for six weeks. And um, I thought it would be a good time to invest um, in learning some more of D3 uh, so that I could use my skills um, working for the newspaper. And uh, it happened that there was a competition, a visualization competition uh, organized by a company selling um, weather data. It was called Climate Crush. And they basically released a data set and they asked people to make something with the data, uh, visual and interactive, and uh, you could win a small amount of money. Um, so um, I used that competition to learn more of D3. And what I ended up making was um, this piece here. I'm going to show it to you. I call it the, the weather browser. Um, and it's still built in the same way of, um, as what we've seen before. So it's D3 based and D3 uh, is basically responsible for everything what is happening. Um, but as you can see here, the data contains more than half a million observations. Um, so I also used other libraries to filter the data um, because um, yeah, that's a lot of data, so I, I needed some uh, additional libraries to work with uh, the data. Um, and I also experimented a little bit with some different kinds of visualization. So the data I worked with was um, observations, hourly observations for um, Cairo and Singapore. So um, this is about temperature, rainfall, wind speed, wind direction, and also cloud cover. So I developed these kind of um, clock visualizations. You can see it here on top is uh, midnight, um, below is noon. Um, so you have 24 hours in one circle. And we're looking at the data of uh, the 1st of January, 2009, and you could go through each day and you could see what kind of weather it was. Um, here you can see, for example, that in Cairo, temperatures were low. You have the, the circle is quite small. Um, the legend is over here for the temperature. Um, we have a little bit of rainfall here in Singapore. These are the, the blue circles here. You have quite strong winds in Singapore, uh, while in Cairo, it was a little bit less windy. And 
um, with this date picker, you get move to time and see what kind of weather it was on uh, any specific day. I also looked at some extremes. So the hottest days, um, the coldest days, um, wettest days, and then some more analysis. Um, so as I said, still the same way of making visualizations using D3 for everything, but also using other libraries. And for example, this date picker is not something that D3 would give you. This is also coming from um, some other libraries. So um, I, I used other libraries to uh, do things that D3 couldn't, obviously. So I ended up uh, not winning the competition, but I ended up uh, in second place, um, which was quite nice. I had learned new things and I also um, won a little bit of money with, uh, with uh, the things I learned. Um, I also submitted the weather browser to the Information is Beautiful Awards, which was a yearly um, uh, award for the best visualizations. Um, and there I also didn't win, but I ended up on the short list, which I think were the, the best hundred um, submissions. Um, and Information is Beautiful Awards. Um, they still have all the uh, listed on their website. It's a great source of inspiration. So you can see all the submissions um, from 2012 up until the last edition in 2019. Uh, you can focus on the winners. Then As you can see, unfortunately, 2019 was the last edition. Um, this has nothing to do with, uh, with the pandemic. Uh, the funding for the awards just stopped, I think, and so the awards are no longer organized, which was a pity because the whole visualization community was a bit organized or came together for these awards. Many people were participating, promoting their submissions. You would also have um, a very nice um, event where the awards were given to the winners, which was also important for the community. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have that anymore. And actually, there is no real big competition or awards anymore awarding or curating the best in data visualization anymore, which I find a bit of a pity because the, the awards really brought the community uh, together. But still, the, the showcase is still uh, quite interesting and can be a good source of inspiration. Then in winter 2014, um, I joined the newspaper and um, I started making pieces, interactive pieces for the newspaper, which were a little bit more complex already. Um, so this is a story I developed um, also around weather data. Uh, it's called How Belgium's Heating Up. And it tells the story and with a single chart, but in steps. So um, I would give you the average temperature for each month. So we go from January on the left to December on the right. This is the average for the period of 1833 to 2015. And you can um, identif identify each line and you can see that each line is a, a single year. And then I'm just highlighting some of these years, so this was 2014, in which it was um, really warm. Then 2015, the same thing. And then the last 10 years, which are, are also quite warm. So I'm just highlighting things here, um, animating things, just to show how temperatures have uh, gradually gone up here and um, of course this is also um, built in D3 but you can see the complexity here you have all these steps and on each step the visualization looks different and you have um, animating things um, but uh, it's it's all still um, based on D3 and, um, and nothing else here. One difference was that um, I needed to transform the data 
so I got the data from the, the Belgian Meteorological Institute, but it wasn't in the right format. So I had to uh, reformat it to in order to get it into D3. Um, and um, this, I think, is one of my first R scripts that I ever wrote. So um, I invested some time in learning R. And I think that was also a really wise decision um, because you can do many of the data manipulations that you can do in R also in JavaScript, but it will be a lot harder. Um, and so my usual way of working is preparing the data in, in R and um, format it so that I can easily work with it in D3. Um, so that in JavaScript, I only have to think about making the visualization and not about data transformation and, and filtering and aggregation and things like that. So um, I learned to use RStudio and I also learned to use the packages from the Tidyverse, um, which contains also the ggplot package in which there will be an, a training in January, I heard from Johan. Um, I'm a big user of ggplot as well. And so um, yeah, I can only recommend um, learning some R and, and learning the, the tidyverse packages. They are really handy. Okay, 2016. And in 2016, I became interested in what is called uh, explorable explanations or explorables. Um, and this is now actually a website and explorables are um, interactive or um, animated explanations. And then uh, you have um, explorable explanations for a lot of different topics. Um, a lot of them are about mathematics, but you also have uh, things like sociology and biology. Um, and you can look at them as kind of the modern way of a textbook article about the topic. Um, people can interact with it and they can um, see visual updates to what you are explaining. And I really believe in the power of explorable explanations. Um, I invite you to take a look at the website and check out some of the um, explanations. They are really great. Um, and I made one myself. I'm going to quickly um, show it to you. It's called Rock and Poll, and it's an explainer about political polling. Um, because at that time at the newspaper, I was a bit annoyed about how my colleague journalists were reporting on political polls, because they were basically ignoring the margins of error that comes with uh, these polls. So I made this interactive explanation where um, if you go through it, you understand where the margin of errors come from. Um, so it's an imaginary country with a thousand inhabitants and um, you don't see the political uh, preferences of the people living in the country at first. So each dot represents a person. And um, when you have elections, the people need to show their preferences. They have to vote. And so I'm showing that here by adding these colors to each person or to each dot. And then when uh, elections are held, the votes are um, counted, or in this case, first sorted. And then they are counted. And you, in this case, in Poland, you have eight different political parties and the red party won the elections in this case. Now imagine that one year after the elections, um, some journalists want to know what uh, is the current political situation in our country. Is the red party still the biggest or have they gone down or are they even bigger or is there another party that is now the biggest? So they pay um, a poll company to organize a poll in, in the country. Um, and so that is what I'm simulating in, in this piece, actually. So we are setting up the poll and then that company starts polling. Um, and that means calling up people and asking them if for what party they would vote for if the elections were held today. And so you can survey these people here and the first person happens to be a supporter of the Red Party. And we can continue. The second one also is from the Red Party. 
third one also. This is by accident. This is all based on um, on chance. Um, I can use a lazy button to go up to ten, and um, seven of the first ten people that we uh, asked about their political preference, they um, support the red party. So you can see there are big differences between um, the election results and what is now um the result in the poll and i'm visualizing the difference here and you can see that uh, the red party is um, very overrepresented in the poll i'm going to speed it up a little bit and in this step i can go up to 100 so we are calling up 100 people and you can see that the differences are now smaller and this shows you that the more people you call, the bigger your sample is, the more accurate your results are. And then a real life poll in my country goes typically up to a thousand people. So we can simulate that as well. So, so after um, polling thousand people, um, you can see the result here of the, of the poll and it's still different than the election results. And you can see here, for example, for the Red Party, um, in the poll, they are underrepresented by 1.4 percentage points. So that's how I explained to my um, colleague journalists that um, you have to be careful and that you can simply not ignore the, um, the margins of error that come with these polling results. And in the end, I explained this by um, showing the results of eight different polls and um, just by chance you'll notice that the the scores for each party will be different um, in each poll just because you uh, um, you called up different people um, they should end soon um, yeah looks like they're in the loop but i think you 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 get the message it's just an, an an interactive and visual way, in this case, to show a simulated poll, and you can see the differences between um, the, 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 the election results and the poll results and the margins of error. Okay, now I can show them. So in the end, I show them by party, and you can see that just by chance in one poll, the numbers are different um, than the next one, um, just because there's some randomness and, and chance um, in the polling process. So again, all built with D3, still using the same um, technology. Um, I wanted to highlight another thing that was important in the in data visualization community, and that is the, the Malofjech Infographic Awards, which were held in Pamplona in Spain every year. Um, I was invited to um, present there, and, and I actually launched my polling um, piece there. Um, and the Infographic Awards uh, also had a jury that chose the, the best visualizations in many different categories. So I was also on the jury. But unfortunately, Malafiech uh, Awards also have stopped. So in 2020, it was the last time they were held. They were held um, remotely. And I think in this case, it does have to do something with the pandemic. Um, but um, it's very unfortunate that the world of data visualization is now also losing these awards because um, they were also a great source of um, inspiration. And I noticed that even the website of the awards um, has vanished. So there is no collection anymore of these uh, award-winning infographics and data visualizations, which I think really is, um, is a pain. There's one other conference that I want to highlight, and this is the Information Plus conference, which was last held in September of this year. Um, and this is a conference that is trying to bridge the gap between uh, academics in data visualization, researchers, and people like me, practitioners who are uh, making visualizations. Um, and I can highly recommend checking out the, the talks of this uh, conference. They are all online and they were uh, filmed. And you can also see 
the talks of previous years and there are many interesting things there. Um, as a practitioner, I try to um, keep track of what is happening in research and sometimes you can learn a lot from uh, what researchers in the field of data visualization have, um, um, have researched. So um, this is definitely a conference uh, to watch and I suspect that uh, this will uh, keep continue and keep will be kept alive for a few more years and not like the other ones who have finished. So um, also important for the community, I think of data visualization is keep track of what is happening in research. And um, this conference is doing exactly that. Okay, 2017, that was the year that I became a freelancer. Um, so that's the year I stopped working for the newspaper and uh, I started doing what I do now. So I'm uh, doing data journalism. Um, I design visualizations and I help organizations with um, making visualizations. And there's someone who should mute himself. Publicity chair or the... the Okay, thank you. Um, one of my main clients from the start was a small company based in Antwerp here in Belgium and called Datilon. And they were making um, a plugin or they um, made a plugin for Illustrator to make charts. Um, and I helped develop that plugin. Um, it's um, actually, it's like a, a small application, a web-based ap application that runs within Illustrator. And the visualizations you see in Illustrator, they are actually um, D3 visualizations. So this tool is using D3 under the hood while it is running in Adobe Illustrator. And um, this is not a secret that many of almost all tools to make visualizations, they use D3 under the hood. It's um, become like an industry standard and um, yeah, most of the tools that you use to make visualizations, especially online, they will use D3 under the hood because it's such a, a good library. It has so much utilities and functions that are handy for making visualizations. And um, this plugin for Illustrator is uh, also an example of that. 2019, here things are starting to become interesting because I, um, got more involved in web development and also modern web development, uh, of course, is something different than what it was 10 years ago. Um, and 2019, I made um, an article about are redrawing their borders in order to get more funds from the European Union. Um, I'm not going to go into details here, but you can see here how Hungary split one of its regions, um, the region around the capital Budapest, and the article explains why uh, Hungary decided to do that. It all has to do with um, money, of course, so um, I start the article by showing a map where you have um, countries with high GDP in green and with low GDP of low uh, economic development in pink. Um, then I show the regions because within each country you have a lot of variability and you have rich countries which also have poorer regions and also poorer countries who have richer regions. So that's what I'm explaining here. Um, I highlight some of the, these um, countries. So in Germany, you, are, you still have the division between the East and the West. In Belgium, the division is more North South. And you have a lot of countries where the capital or the region around the capital is richer than um, the other regions of the, of the country. Um, and here I explain that one of the goals of the EU is to distribute the money so that the poorer regions can catch up with uh, the richer regions. So um, to bridge the gap between uh, poor and uh, rich regions. And so it's the least developed regions that are highlighted here who receive the most money from the EU from these funds. And then 
um, I switched the map to a chart and um, I specifically made the transi transition um, animated because I wanted to make sure that readers would understand that each dot um, on this chart is actually a region on the map. So if I go back, the animation it goes in the reverse direction and you can see that each dot um, morphs into a region. Um, and so I wanted to highlight this um, because this is something um, that's not trivial. Um, and so what I needed to do or what I needed in order to be able to do this was use some other JavaScript library, which I'll talk about in a minute. Then I add some more explanation here, um, but the, the um, most important part of the story is here explained. So this is, you can see the, the same map again. And this region here around the capital city of Budapest, um, it was just above the EU average in terms of GDP. And what it did was split its richer part um, off from the poorer part, which means that the poorer part now had more access to the EU funds and the richer part, which uh, actually don't, doesn't need the EU funds um, that, that hard, um, it became even, it became richer because the, the wealth is concentrated in, uh, in the capital region there. But uh, that's the, the reason why these countries decided to split their regions. So um, what I used in this project was not the full D3 library. So up until now, I was um, loading the full library and, and just using the functions of the, of the library. Now I'm in using what is called D3 modules. So since D3 version four, um, D3 is split into modules and you can pick the modules you like and install them um, when you're developing a visualization. Uh, so you don't need to load the full big D3 library anymore. You can just use the, the, the parts and bits that you need. Then I also used Scroll Llama. This is a library that you can use to make these scrolly telling um, visualizations and stories. So uh, you scroll down and the text updates, but also the visualization updates. So that's a library that can help you with that. And then for the animation, I used Flubber, which you can use to animate um, SVG shapes from one shape to another. Um, so the first three here are JavaScript libraries, and then I also used npm, which is the node package um, manager, um, which you can use to install modules. So with npm, I installed the D3 models that I needed, and I also installed Scrollana and Flubber. And then Gulp finally um, is, um, yeah, maybe I can better explain um, what is happening by showing you the, the diagram again. Um, so it's the same kind of diagram that you've seen before, but now you can see that D3 actually has a module called D3 scale, it's, it's part of D3. So I'm importing the uh, D3 scale function and I'm also importing the Flubber library into my um, HTML. Um, so not the full D3 library anymore. So I am using, or I am importing less code. The, the file size of the library uh, is um, not less, but because I import the D3 scale module, I can use the functions just I, as I was before. Um, and um, what happens before, um, putting this online is that I'm using um, a bundler, which means that the different JavaScript files will be bundled into one and they will also be minified, which means that they will have a smaller file size. Um, they do that by changing variable names to shorter variable names um, and, and they use some other tricks for that as well. So that means that whenever I'm developing something locally on my computer, the code will be a bit different than what I ship to the server. Uh, what I ship to the server that will um, um, 
which will serve the final product to all the, the readers. So there is a build step. At one point you say, okay, I, my local development is ready. Now I'm going to bundle all the JavaScript functions and, and, and um, modules that I need into a single small file. And that is what I'm going to ship to uh, the production server. And um, in the end, it is still D3 that um, is interacting with the page because I'm um, also using a D3 model called D3 selection, which you can use to manipulate things on the page or add things to the page or remove things to the page. Um, so the difference is that I'm picking what I'm using from D3, not loading the full library and combining it with other modules, other libraries. And then before shipping it to a, the production server, I bundle everything together um, into a single JavaScript file. Um, and that was um, actually what the, the, last, um, the last one here, the Gulp is one of these bundlers. So you can use Gulp to bundle the JavaScript files together and then you can ship it. And then and um, yeah, main advantage is that you have smaller file sizes, um, which of course is quite important in, um, in web development. Some other major trends in 2019 that I detected. Um, and the first one is that in 2019, Salesforce, which is a, a big um, software company, um, customer relations um, software company, acquired Tableau. And Tableau is an, um, a dashboard building tool, a tool to make visualizations. And the amount of money involved was $15.7 billion. So a really, really big amount of money to acquire a, a data visualization company. And I think this shows that uh, around the world and especially in business, data visualization um, was not an, something niche anymore. It, it really shows that it's, it's now mainstream and that people see the value of data visualization. And also in 2019, the Data Visualization Society was created. And you can see it there from the tagline where data visualization practitioners come together. For the first time, there is an organization that is trying to support um, people working in data visualization. And they do this by um, organizing many different things. So you have Nightingale, which is a publication, an online publication, which soon will also be printed. You have a list of resources, you have a, a jobs board, um, there is a yearly conference as well. Um, so they are really trying to organize the, the data visualization um, field and, and people working in it. And I think it's a great initiative, especially given that um, the Information is Beautiful Awards have been uh, deprecated and that uh, Malofiek Awards also have vanished. Um, so maybe the Data Visualization Society will also be the organization that um, is going to create some new awards um, to award the, the best in, in data visualization. So yeah, two trends that I wanted to highlight, which were both happening in 2019, and, uh, the acquisition of Tableau and uh, the Data Visualization Society. I think you can get, you, you can become a member for free, um, at the Data Visualization Society. So it might be worth checking out. 2020, so last year, um, I mostly spent my days working on the Atlas of Sustainable Development Goals for the World Bank. Um, let me quickly show you um, how that looks like. So um, the Sustainable Development Goals are 17 goals that um, were set some years ago. I'm not sure um, when exactly anymore. Um, and each of these 17 goals has a topic. So SDG one is about poverty, um, many different topics. Uh, let me show you this one. SDG four is about education. 
Um, so I help building these stories, developing the visualizations, and also developing the narrative or the, the structure of the articles. And um, as you can see here, we're using some scrolly telling as well. So you can see the, um, the visuals updating. Um, when new information scrolls by. And um, we're also having these interactive visualizations. So um, you can hover over, and I think you can even filter or highlight by using the legend here. Um, so many uh, visualizations, many of these scrolly telling components, all based on data with a lot of different kinds of visualizations. Um, so, um, yeah, these stories, they try to um, explain what is going on um, worldwide on a global scale for each of the 17 uh, topics of the sustainable development goals. And um, I think I built nine of the 17 stories. And um, what we were using for these stories is uh, React. Um, and, um, let me try to explain what React is by going back to the diagram here. So instead of D3 interacting with the elements on the page, it will be React that controls what is rendered on the page and um, how things are updated. So the React controls what is called the DOM, the document object model. Um, so it decides what elements um, are added, what elements are removed, and how uh, elements are updated. The good thing of the D3 modularity that we now have is that you can use D3 modules within React. So you can use, for example, the scale functions of D3 within React. Um, so you can uh, use these functions and Within React, you can let D3 calculate um, the visual properties of these elements. So you have the circles here, and with D3 scales, you can calculate the X and Y positions, the size and the color of, of these elements. The only difference now is that um, you're not using D3 to add these circles to your charts. Um, as I said, React controls the, the elements on the page. So you need to let React uh, I'm sorry, you need to let React add these elements uh, to the page. Um, so it's not D3 anymore in control, but um, it's, it's React that decides what is rendered and what is not. That has some implications, um, namely that um, because D3 is not in control anymore, you lose some of the capabilities uh, of D3. Uh, like, for example, animating things. D3 has some built-in functions to uh, interpolate and animate and transition things. React doesn't. Um, and because React is now in control, you lose the capabilities of uh, animating things. This is how React looks like um, when you are uh, writing the code for the visualizations. And this is actually the code for this, this bubble chart here. Um, you recognize some things from the D3 uh, courses that we had. So you have an SVG with a certain width and height, which are computed by, by React. Um, you have here a group element called bubbles G, or it has a class name of bubbles G. And then you have a little bit of JavaScript here that loops over an array called countries. And um, this is very typical for React and other frameworks that you kind of mix up HTML and JavaScript. So um, I'm saying here that for each element in the countries array, which contains the data, um, we should return a circle and the circle would uh, these circles would have properties like the x coordinate and y coordinate and these are calculated by elements from the data but also by these scales and these scales are d3 scales so we're using d3 scales in react to compute um, where the circles uh, should be positioned but it's actually react that adds these circles to the page um, you have here also uh, a scale for the size of the circle. You have the color scale. 
um, and some other properties. Um, but this is kind of how you um, go from data to visual elements in React. And as you'll notice here, we're still using D3 to compute where everything should go and how everything should look like. Um, 2020 was, of course, also the year of the start of the pandemic, and uh, I wanted to highlight some of the visuals uh, related to the pandemic as well. This is from a piece on the Washington Post website, and it is actually the most read story on the site of the Washington Post. And they also did the effort to translate this into different languages. So I can switch to uh, Spanish here as well. Um, this was published in March 2020, so really the early days of the pandemic where many people didn't uh, really know what was going on. And so uh, it's an article that explains how a virus spread um, among or to a population. And it does that with some really nice um, simulations. So here it explains that uh, when one person infects another, they become sick. And after uh, some time, these people, they recover. Um, so a really simple model. And you can see here the animation playing out. You, see, you can see the infection spreading. And on top, we have a little chart that shows you the proportion of infected people. And um, after some time, you can also see the proportion of people who recovered from the illness, the, the orange or the, the pink uh, area here. And so really nice animation. Here they are uh, simulating a lockdown of a city to try to contain the virus within, uh, within one part of the population. But you can see um, once it gets out, um, the disease spreads further to other um, areas there. And here they are um, explaining distanciamento social. So what happens if people have less contact? Then you can see that the virus is spreading a um, little less fast. A really interesting article. Um, as I said, the top most um, read article on the website of the Washington Post. And actually, I think from the top 10 most read articles on the website, seven or eight are pieces that were made by the visual desk at the Washington Post. So newsrooms all over the world are noticing that um, these visual pieces with a lot of data visualizations that um, people are really drawn to those and that they can really work. So um, newsrooms are, are not all newsrooms, but a lot of newsrooms are investing in um, hiring people who can make good graphics and who can tell a story with, uh, with graphics. I also wanted to show you something here. If I go and inspect this element, you notice that it, it's not an SVG, uh, it's a canvas element. A canvas element is like um, a, a blank canvas in, in, the, in a web page that you can paint to with JavaScript, but um, in SVG, you can say, I want a circle, I want it to be that big, and I want it at that position. In Canvas, you have to tell the browser for each pixel what color it should have. So it's a, a different kind of um, interacting and programming visuals. Um, but uh, in this case, it makes a lot of sense because you have all these circles who have to be moving and they bounce into each other. If you do that with SVG, um, the computational power that you need to do this simulation is quite big. And it's a bit less when you do it in, in Canvas. And so I'm including here a link to HTML Canvas because um, I'm seeing it popping up more and more, especially for these um, animated things. Um, so, um, yeah, you can learn how, here how to uh, interact with, uh, with the canvas. So you have here a little uh, JavaScript snippet that is generating this uh, green rectangle here, um, just as a small example. 
I also ran into the limitations of uh, SVG uh, last year while I was working with a data set of 40,000 um, organisms organized in, in, in a hierarchy. Um, when I wanted to show this as some kind of network um, in SVG, it just became too slow. And I also had to switch to, to Canvas. So you can see here um, the, the layout that I generated to show the, this collection of 40,000 um, organisms. Um, under the hood, it's still using D3 to calculate the position of everything, but the rendering is done on, on Canvas and, and not on SVG. And finally, some other web technology that I uh, want to show you. Um, in my experience, streaming this kind of visuals uh, over Zoom is not very, um, successful so i'm i'm not sure what you will be able to see uh, here but you have this spinning globe and you can interact with it so you can drag it around you can also zoom in and out if you like a little bit i can change the um the data layers that it is showing uh, so this is something that i built for um, the companies that is selling satellite data. And they wanted to have this spinning globe um, and they wanted to have it interactive. And you can do that also in D3, um, but I decided to use another technology here, which is called WebGL. And this is another technology built into modern browsers that you can use to make graphics. Um, so again, an, uh, a link to some uh, documentation of how you can use WebGL. And there are also libraries that can help you build um, animations and, and, and things like a, a globe in WebGL. So I didn't start from scratch. I use libraries who help me. Um, so apart from SVG, you have other, um, other things that you can make visuals in, in the browser, um, like Canvas and WebGL. They are more powerful in the sense that um, they use the computing power of your computer in a more efficient way, but the drawback is that it's harder to program your visuals. It's, it's not so easy as saying, I want a circle and I want it there. It's a bit more complicated than that. Okay, 2021, last year, before we take a little uh, break. Um, this year, I um, really started using Svelte for um, clients, projects, and um, I have here two examples. The first one is a dashboard about some um, European statistics related to um, the efficiency of buildings or how buildings are responsible for um, the use of fossil fuels around Europe. Um, so not going to go too deep into the details here, but you can see these little mini charts here. They are organized in a somewhat geographical manner. So you have a little map in the background. Um, you can use different indicators. So these are um, official statistics coming from Eurostat. Uh, um, like for example, population living in bad housing conditions is one. For some of these, you have different units. So you have some climate corrected values and also per capita values. The charts are a little bit interactive. So you, um, well, we should get some tooltips on the values. Um, you can also click them to make them bigger. Then you can more easily access the tooltips. And each country also has a country page where um, the different um, measures are shown for that country. And you have here a drop down um, where you can switch from one country to another. So not too complicated, um, but there are some things in the dashboard that justify the use of Svelte. And um, one thing is, um, that you can reuse components. So each of these little mini charts is one component. And what I'm doing here on the front page is just pushing um, different country data to each of these components. So they show the different curves for the different countries. Um, you also see 
that when I change the units here, all the charts change units, of course. Um, so you have to have a way to communicate the, that there are new units to all of these uh, little charts. Um, and when you have to wire up things like that, um, then it makes sense to use a framework like React, but also um, Svelte is really good at, uh, at doing that. So when you have reusable components and things that have to be updated in multiple places, then it's probably good to start thinking about using um, a JavaScript framework. Another one that I use felt for is um, for the Swiss Statistical Office. Um, they publish data about the names of uh, newborns, so of uh, babies. Um, quite a big data set because they split it up into um, different uh, language regions. So you have data for the whole of Switzerland, but also separately for the German speaking part of Switzerland and the French speaking part. Um, again, you see this reusable components, these little charts. It's actually just one Svelte component that is uh, receiving data for each name and then displaying it. Um, here at the bottom, we have a more complicated chart where you really can explore the data. So you can um, hover over the lines to identify names. You can click them to select them, or you can uh, search for data. So my oldest daughter's name is Pia, so I can also add her here. Um, you can uh, look at the name for girls or the name for boys. And you can also switch uh, from language region. So now we have French names for boys. Um, and um, again, when you have things wired up, whenever I select a line on the chart, when I click a line on the chart, this component over here is showing the selected names. And when I select a name here, it's also displayed on the chart. So um, those things are bound together. When you change one, the other changes. And when the other changes, the, the first one changes as well. This is also really typical of these frameworks. They make it quite easy to, to do things like that. To do it in pure JavaScript is hard um, because um, you have to keep track what things are connected to each other and um, quickly you'll notice that your code will become what is called spaghetti code, where you have um, all these things manually updating. The framework just makes it a little bit more easy to, um, to do things like this. So that's um, where Svelte came in. Um, and um, I'll explain how Svelte is different from React by using the diagram again here. Um, so again, D3 with its modules, um, you have Svelte that is taking control of the HTML and, and the document. Um, similar to React, it controls what is added to the, to the document, what is removed and what, how things are updated. Like in React, you can use D3 uh, modules and functions. Um, and one major advantage of Svelte, um, Oh yeah, sorry. So it's felt that it's adding the, the visuals to the page. So it's not D3, it's, it's felt that uh, controls these uh, things. One of the advantages of Svelte is that you have some built-in functionalities that are really uh, helpful for visualizations like Svelte motion, which makes it easy to animate things. Um, and in the second part of the session, I'll show you how that works. And you also have things like measuring the, the space that the visualization has. So, so you can measure how big the parent container is. So you can set the width of your SVG, for example, to that size. Um, and when things resize, you can make your visualization respond to that. So it's really um, much more than React. It is built with visualization in mind. Main thing, main difference with React is that when you build your application, when you are going to send it to the production server, it is bundled together and the, the whole framework disappears and 
um, is actually just compiled to normal JavaScript, which means that you will have a very small bundle size, uh, especially compared to React, which can have a very big bundle size. And it's uh, just running um, JavaScript out of the box, so it's really fast. So it's small and fast. And I think for small applications, um, Svelte is actually a better choice than React. Um, so in my opinion, Svelte gives you all advantages of uh, JavaScript frameworks like reusable component, components and uh, reactivity without all the drawbacks that these uh, big frameworks have. So there's no complicated syntax that you have to learn. The bundle size is much smaller and you don't need additional plugins for things like animations, which you do need for, uh, for React. And actually, this is a tweet from yesterday. This is from Rich Harris, the, the creator of Svelte. Um, he used to work at the New York Times and he uh, joined now a company where he is allowed to work full time on Svelte. So I think the development of Svelte from now on will uh, speed up and it will uh, become even um, better than it is now. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I really, um, I'm really in the Svelte camp now, and whenever I get to choose for a project, I, I, I use Svelte um, instead of uh, all the other frameworks. Of course, sometimes clients are already working with the framework, then I have to fit in. But when I have to choose, or when I can choose, I use uh, Svelte. Okay, I think it's time for a little break now. Um, and after the break, I'm going to show you the same bubble chart that we made in D3, but this time made in, um, in Svelte or in Svelte and D3. And I think with uh, explaining how the chart is made, you'll have a better understanding of how Svelte works. So let's take a five minute break and um, we can see each other again here at 17, 15, 17, 16, something like that. <laughs> 